Anyway, um, thank, thank you all for coming. Um, now, I don't know if you, how many of you near here know Dirk Hum? Any, uh, well, it's Dirk's last year at the uh, conference this year. He's been a stalwart attender for many, many years. But he's now, going f he's now gone full time as a presentation coach. So I'm very glad he's not here watching me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but one of his tips is that giving out chocolate is always a good thing. So I have chocolate. Unfortunately, there's more than 16 of you. So you won't all get one. But Anyway, um, before we start as well, I'm just kind of curious. After a morning of who recognizes this well-known rock lyric, I'm just wondering if anybody here knows where this one comes from. Or indeed, what the next line is. <laughs> no, nobody. Um, okay, it's a song by an um, Irish group called The Saw Doctors. Um, and if you're interested, the next line, which is the chorus, uh, Jesus Christ Almighty, I'd love to bang the bangles. <laughs> right, um, now, this afternoon's, this afternoon's little um, me talking in your sleep is about, it's going to revolve around the results of this document. This is RFC 1034, which appeared in November 1987. Um, and together with its counterpart, RFC 1035, it describes how the internet domain name system was to work. Okay? And unusually, for a piece of software design from 30 years ago this year, it still works pretty much the same way. Give or take a little. And what I'm trying, going to try and do this afternoon is give you basically just a quick run through what the domain name system is and perhaps more importantly, what's changed since 1987 and what is changing in it at the moment. It's very easy. I, I naively thought that DNS was done and dusted many, many years ago. But in fact, there's a surprising amount of activity in it at the moment. Um, I'm not, to be clear, going to talk about uh, operational side of it. I'm not going to talk about how to run your own DNS server. Um, I'm not going to talk about the issues of updating zone files and all that stuff. Um, I'm just going to try and concentrate, it on, concentrate on it as DNS from the point of view of people like me, i.e. an application programmer who actually wants to look stuff up at some point. Uh, now, uh, I'm getting old. Okay. Right. Now, the story goes that Paul Mokopetris, this is this guy, who was the author of that RFC, um, and together with this guy, generally evolved the domain name concept as we know it. Now, does anybody know who this gentleman was? No? <laughs> One of the original, one of the original greybeards. Uh, that is, that is the late lamented John Postel. And the story goes that Postel originally asked Mokopetris to go away and produce a thin synthesis of the three or four ideas that were floating around at the time for how we, how the, a domain name system could be implemented. Um, and that Mocha Petris, being a true programmer, went away and implemented something completely different to all the, all the other proposals. But, uh, anyway, now, a further question. Would anybody, this is, this is something related to me, and it was the first one that I ever had. Would anybody care to guess what it is? It's an email address. Well done. I, th I think we need to chuck a few of these out there. <laughs> Generally, uh, uh, yeah, it's a UUCP, it's a UUCP bank path address. And I bring it up because I thought we'd start by having a look at just 
what there was before. Now, for those of you, as you can see, I'm working on the gray bit, but I haven't got there yet. Um, for those of you who've never come across it, across the UCP bank path addressing before, that dot, dot, dot was where you stepped in. Because what that meant was, you're going to have to know what the route is to get as far as MUCVAX. Okay? So you needed stuff like this. This is a 1986 map of the world according to UUCP. Yeah, so here's, here's McVax over in the corner. I actually used to just generally say, get as far as INHP4 or HP Labs or Seismo, and they'll probably know at that point. Now, and incidentally, this is the European. McVax was, was in Amsterdam, and it was the center of the European uh, UUCP. Uh, <coughs> distribution system. I, at the time, was a postgrad at UKC, University of Can Canterbury, which was the, the main UK node. Uh, and this system, as you can see, was international. Um, UT Zoo, up in the top right hand corner, is the University of Toronto Zoology, for various historical reasons, uh, um, revolving around a guy called Henry Spencer. But anyway, um, Munnery. That, that was, uh, that's in Australia. And believe it or not, in about 1986, I actually had a real-time conversation over email with somebody in Australia. This is email that was going over dial-up at the time, and they just happened to be dialed up. The, the UKC used to get absolutely ferocious phone bills. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the occasional screw-up as well, as, um, because... Um, as, as the world developed and we started moving away from bank path addressing because we were all very jealous of people on the ARPANET. If I'd been on the ARPANET, I'd have had an email address like that. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and, so, um, and so we started moving towards a system where dot network that you were on followed your host name. It was also dot bitnet. Okay, and over, over a few years, that evolved into uh, ukc.ac.uk. And unfortunately, at the same time, the Janet Academic Network in the UK had implemented its own email system, which ran the, the domains the other way round. So it was uk.ac.ukc. Okay, um, and there was something called Sendmail UK, which tried to reverse them for you. <laughs> believe it or not, and there were occasional embarrassing incidents with the routing tables where all the UKC's outbound, all the UK's outbound email, or sorry, all UKC's email traffic found itself somewhere at the University of Kentucky, <laughs> UK, uh, and I mean there was actually another rather embarrassing incident where all the UK's outbound traffic, somebody had really screwed up the routing table, and all the UK's outbound traffic was going down a 300 board dial up link to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> For no readily apparent reason. Anyway, so uh, people were working on this stuff all the time. This is um, RFC 805, which is basically a report by John Postel of a meeting they had talking about where they could possibly go in the direction of. They were thinking particularly of emails. Use that at something which was going to be a bit more like what we, recommend, we would reckon, recognize as a domain today. And in fact, the predecessor of RFC 1034, um, RFC 882 and 883, which appeared no less than four years before, um, does describe something that is close to um, what actually transpired in 1034. The first version of BIND was written in 1984. So 1034, I'm cheating a bit, 1034, this 30th anniversary, was really documenting what they'd arrived at by that stage. So while this was going on, on the ARPANET or internet, how did you find the location of the, the address of a host that you wanted. Well, this was the official answer, RFC 952 and its predecessors. 
and basically you FTP'd a file called hosts.txt <laughs> off SRI, <laughs> of one known good host. Um, so, you know, this was, this was actually quite well established, but fairly obviously was not going to scale down the <laughs> So, the DNS, the domain name system, what is it? Well, this is descriptions taken from the RFCs, incidentally. It's a consistent namespace used for referring to resources because there's a lot more in DNS than just addresses. It's maintained in a distributed manner. There is no one global source of all the information that's in DNS. Okay. And it makes heavy use of local caching so that it's got some hope of performing at a global scale. And the domain, or the domain name organization is critical to all this. Okay. You start at the root node. Now, the root node is generally referred to as just dot or null. Underneath it, you have the so-called top-level domains, which some of which are known in the shorthand as CCTLD, country code, top-level domains. Okay. And then there are the traditional top-level domains, but now, of course, ICANN has its filthy hands on all this, and the number of top-level domains has exploded in recent years. Um, I, I must admit, I'm a bit of a cynic about this. I, I think expansions in the domain space, well, like, for example, in the UK, you, where historically you could only register .co.uk or .org.uk, you can now, with much fanfare from Nominet, register foo.uk if you want to. I personally tend to regard this as basically a protection racket. Um, charging, yeah, <clears throat> open up a bit more space and hope that people will feel that they need to get their own identifiers in it to protect their brand and you can charge them for it. The important thing here is these, these outlines here. The zones in which it's all divided up into. And I've got another picture here, which, because uh, the point I want to make about this is that the zone boundaries are the point where somebody else takes over maintaining all the information about what's in their zone. Um, so we have ICANN slash IANA running the root zone. Okay, this is, this is from a Canadian presentation. So Ciara running .ca, Verisign who run .net and .com, but notice that Verisign.ca is also in the Verisign zone. Okay. Uh, yes, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> To end on. Um, anyway, moving on. So, how do you? Where does this information sit? Well, the fundamental place the information sits is in what's called authoritative servers. The DNS makes a distinction between recursive, uh, yeah, recursive servers and authoritative servers. Now. They may be separate bits of software, or they may be the same piece of software. Bind can be both, but there are other popular name servers where you have specific authoritative as distinct from recursive servers. The authoritative server contains all the data for a particular zone, and typically it's run by the zone owner, and they are responsible for everything in it. Okay. The special case, in a way, of authoritative servers are the root servers. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about root servers because my current job is writing a piece of software that actually runs on a bunch of the root servers. Don't worry, it's not serving your name information. We're perfectly safe. It's just logging what's going on. Okay. The root servers, there, there's a fixed list of IP addresses, IP4 and IP6 addresses, which is encoded into every device that uses the domain name system. It tells them where they can go to start the process of a lookup. 
there are 13 servers. Well, no, there aren't. <laughs> okay. There are 13 logical servers, and I'll explain more about, I'll talk more about 13 at the moment. They're run by a variety of different organizations. I, I work on LROOT, which is run by ICAM. LROOT is actually, it's an Anycast address, and there are roughly 450 servers scattered around the world. Okay. Um, handling varying traffic levels, it has to be said. The busiest node, I think, is currently in Seoul or Beijing. And they are serving hundreds of thousands of queries a second. Um, and if you're interested, somewhere between 90 and 98% of queries on the root servers are just total junk. <laughs> They're just random strings of about 30, up to 30 characters. I'm, and I don't know why. Um, <laughs> I really have no idea. If you're quick and you've counted the list, you'll discover that there's actually 12 organizations on the list. The reason for that is that Verifi VeriSign bought network solutions who are one of them. VeriSign and NetNod and Write also operate fairly large um, uh, server farms. Some of the rest of these are literally two PCs in somebody's office. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> so, in other words, LROOT is one of the busiest root <sighs> servers uh, on the planet. Uh, that's a good question. The, I, as far as I know, the ICANN ones aren't particularly node, ba node balanced. They're just distributed. So, I mean, so for example, um, I know there's two nodes in Beijing, one of which is creaking, is, is, is absolutely on its knees, and the other one of which gets much lower traffic, and I've got no idea what's going on. They're not actually, although I can operate them, they're not located in, they're typically just a server plonked in somebody else's um, in somebody else's uh, installation. And so I can operate the server, but otherwise they're somewhat at the mercy of whoever runs the data center. The, the should route to the nearest server. Yes, it does. It, it definitely tries to route to the nearest server, but this is... Well, this is the yeah. But, um, but, but, I mean, typically each location will have two or at least two or three different servers. For some reason, Prague has got loads, and LA has loads as well. There's about three in Paris, and uh, never mind. Right, the, the, next, the other sort of server, and the server that you're going to come across, is the recursive server. Now, these are the servers that will, will do the lookup for you. They'll scan the hierarchy scan down the hierarchy looking for the thing that you asked for, okay? And they cache results and use the cached results in future queries. Now, these are typically run by your ISP or your big organization, or they're an open server. Well, famously, Google's 8888 and 8844. Uh, Open DNS is another is another large organisation that has a global network uh, of uh, recursive servers, uh, which which they use to provide um, some value added DNS stuff um, for some values of value added. But <laughs> <laughs> and finally, there's the stub resolver. Now, a stub resolver is typically the thing that sits on your machine. And it's fielding, it is, it's doing the lookup. Now, typically, it's just talking to a recursive server somewhere else. But in fact, stub reservers can be a little more complicated or maybe getting a little more complicated, and we'll be coming to that soon. Um, it's not unknown, incidentally, these days for, there are some, certainly Linux distributions, which actually plonk um, an entire production grade DNS recursive server on your system um, to do quite, to do uh, to take care of the name lookups. Uh, again, for reasons that uh, I'll come to. So 
for a protocol that's 30 years old, 30, 30 plus years old, let's have a quick look at actually what goes on the wire. Because, because it's fun. That's all. This is the format of, this is the overall format of a DNS message. Okay. At the front, we have, importantly, a query ID. That's supposed to be a, well, unique-ish 16-bit number identifying your particular query. The next important thing we have is a single bit flag, the query response flag. Um, zero for a query, one for a response. <laughs> so you know what it is. Um, opcode, there's a four-bit opcode which is pretty much always zero. Um, there are a couple of other codes that could do things, but they're not of interest to us, except possibly code two, I think, which is a service uh, where some, some name servers will respond and tell you who they are to that. Um, anyway, after that, we've got four, flag, four, four bit flags. AA is authoritative answer. If that flag set, you just asked a question to an authoritative server, which it knows the answer to. So it's telling you that, yeah, this is from the horse's mouth. Okay. Um, if you ask a recursive server, you'll get the AA bit set if your question was not already in the cache. If it was answered from the cache, then that bit will be clear. Okay. Uh, TC is telling you that truncation happened, i.e. the server received your message, but it couldn't decode all of it. You didn't, it didn't get enough. I'll come a bit more to that later. Uh, our, whoops, sorry. RD and RA are um, recursion desirable and recursion allowed. That's all. The server will set recursion allowed to tell you whether it'll recurse or not. Um, ignore AD and CD. I'll be coming back to them much later. Um, regard them as part of Z, which just, they should be all zeros. Okay. Finally, there's uh, a response code. That's basically the um, that's basically the error code. Um, if DNS, it, well, DNS does have a 404. It's probably we probably say it's NX domain. That's where you'll get that back. And then after that, you have four four blocks of items: questions, answers answer resource records, authority resource records, and additional resource records. These things are just the counts of how many items are in each of these. Okay. Now, interestingly, one of them you might think is slightly superfluous in that questions. Yes, you can send more than one question to a server. It'll answer the first <laughs> <laughs> and ignore the rest. I did actually have a look, and although, because um, actually sending zero questions is perfectly legal as well, <laughs> you just won't get a very interesting answer <laughs> from it. I did have a look, and there's probably, on, at least on the root server logs I was looking at, there's probably a couple of queries an hour where somebody's asking two questions. I, one, of the, one of the fundamental rules in the DNS, and I suspect the wider internet community, is basically, it doesn't matter how boneheaded, how stupid, and how totally illogical anything is, some idiot on the internet is doing it. <laughs> and I've got some more stories about that in a moment. Anyway, a quick closer look at what's in a question. Well, a question comprises a name, which in the questions is usually referred to as a Q name, just to underline that it's a question name. That is the name that you're looking up. Now, in fact, the data representation, it splits each one of the components of your, of your question um, at the dot and gives you a separate, uh, a separate string for each with a length in front. But you don't really need to know that. It all gets translated backwards and forwards for presentation purposes. There is one of the reasons for doing that is that um, if it does come across a component that's already occurred earlier in the message, it can choose to do some compression by just referring back to that earlier um, uh, label they're called. Names are, each individual item is, is a label. There's a type. Now, this is the type of question you're asking, and I'll come back to those in a moment. 
and finally there's a class now on virtually on every query that you send the class will be a constant i n for this is an internet thing please <laughs> okay there are two other defined classes called chaos and hesiod and if anybody remembers what they are <laughs> your beard is even grayer than mine uh, <laughs> Now, hopefully, you'll get a response back, and the response will look like this. So, so far, so familiar. Your question is always sent back to you. Okay, so you get the name and the type and the class back. The next crucial thing you get, certainly if it's, uh, particularly if it's a, uh, an answer with some data in it, is a TTL, a time to live. Okay, it's a number of seconds, and it's telling a caching recursive server, you may put this in your cache, and you may keep it in your cache for this many seconds. Now, typically for domains that you don't expect to change very often, that will have a value in days, if not weeks. Okay, um, one of the things that I do all the time when I'm fiddling with my own domains is change them and forget to drop the TTL to something other than the default, which is usually for me an hour. So that means I screw it up and I have to wait an hour before I can fix anything. <laughs> and then finally, there's a 16-bit length of data followed by a binary chunk of that many bytes. Okay, different types of messages, that what actually is in this depends on the type of message. Okay? That, uh, yeah. Question about that diagram. So, name at the top is 16 bit wide. But oh, yeah, the 16, no, yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned. I'm not quite sure why it says that because it's not 16 bits wide. It's however long it may well be, it's however long it's going to be. Uh, I think in practice, um, it may be a minimum of 16 bits, but I'm not, sh don't quote me on that. It might, it might do. It might do. Certain, certainly, you have to have a, a zero at the end, which indicates the end of the label. Okay, right. okay, so I suspect actually the shortest name you're ever going to get is the root, which is actually in here represented as a zero length string. I don't know, don't quote me on that one. Anyway, here's some common, uh, there's a lot of our R types, and nearly all of them are of historical interest only. Um, I don't expect many of you want to find information about your X25 devices out of the DNS these days. These are the ones that you're going to come across. The, the canonical one is A, an IP4 address, um, followed increasingly these days by uh, what's known in the business as a quad A, which is an IP6 address. Many of you will also have come across um, the MX record which tells you where the SMTP servers for a domain are and in what priority you should be using them. Um, the NS record tells you where to find the name servers for a particular domain, and we'll be coming back to that. Um, pointer and text and SOA, that and A and MX and NS are all survivors from the original, and they're still very much in use. Um, I don't think serv uh, specify specifying location of servers for services. This is a generic mechanism um, for doing this kind of thing, but for general services. You can put a string in your DNS to tell software that knows about it where it might care to find your IMAP server, for example, that sort of thing. Now, transmission. All this happens over UDP. Everybody knows that, okay? Well, yes, it all happens over UDP, except when it, ha when, except when it goes over TCP, <laughs> because even when you go back to the original RFC, there is a problem in that the, max, the minimum guaranteed size of a UDP datagram in IPv4 is 576 bytes. If you've got a lot of information you may well end up with a UDP packet that's too big to hold that. Okay, and in fact, RFC 1035 says that in a UDP, uh, a UDP DNS message should have a maximum payload of no more than 512 bytes, which leaves a little bit of a header. Okay, and it's that 512 bytes 
that gives rise to the limit of 13 root servers. Because there are some circumstances where you will be reporting the location of all the root servers. And if you add up all the information that you need to send, you could just squeeze 14 in, but it doesn't really leave you a lot of wiggle room. So they went for 13. And so, so that's where that magic number comes from. There's also, incidentally, 13 uh, global TLD servers um, as well. That's uh, servers, yeah, so that's servers for the likes of .NET and .com, the traditional TLDs. Um, anyway, if you're so, the original RFC said, yeah, if it's too big, and you'll find out because you'll get a response back with the TC bit set saying, no, your query was truncated. In that case, you should fall back to TCP. Okay, and in TCP, you send exactly the same message, but with two bytes of length in front of it. Um, now, the TCP path is not the path well-traveled. Um, there's probably only about five, 1 to 5% of queries end up going that way at the moment. It's not well exercised in the DNS software until relatively recently it was possible to do a denial of service attack by just opening up a bunch of TCP connections and sitting on them. Um, because uh, I think, you think <coughs> one name server, which I won't name, um, didn't really monitor this and it had a fixed number of TCP sessions it would accept at once. But, uh, anyway. Um, IP6, incidentally, when we've finally finished transitioning, IP6 has a minimum uh, MTU of 1280 bytes. So maybe we might get some more root servers at some stage. <laughs> anyway, progress, progress. Anyway, now I'm, I'm going to try and take my life into my hands here. I don't expect this will work. But we'll just do a little look up to try and illustrate what happens. Um, now many of you, I suspect, will be familiar with, is this going to work? Ah, there are. Many of you, I suspect, will be familiar with this tool, DIG. Do you remember what it stands for? Domain Information Groper. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, eh? So, um, in preparation for this talk, um, I registered a new domain. Okay. And we'll try and look up an A record for it. Now, and what we're going to get back is a reply. Here's the question that we were asking. We've got back a reply saying, this is a response. Um, recursion was desirable and recursion was available. This is, all, this is, instantly, this is coming off the whatever DNS, uh, DNS recursive server that the hotel Wi-Fi provides. Okay. And it succeeded. It's found us an answer. We've got one answer. And here it is. And there's its TTL. It's also telling us, in the authority section, it's telling us the name servers, the NS record. It's telling us the name servers that are responsible for this name, should we wish to find anything more about it. And to help us out in case we do, in the additional section, it's providing the addresses of those name servers. You don't necessarily get the addresses of the name servers. If they're in a different zone, you won't. And your, your resolver is going to have to go and look those up itself. But if you're in the same zone, or the machine already has it handy, then you could be in luck. Thank you. Sorry? Additional five. That's a very good question. I have absolutely no idea at all. Because um, there are definitely only four of them, isn't there? <coughs> well, that's a puzzle. I'll have to... Uh, <clears throat> I have to ask an expert about that. Anyway. <laughs> right. Um, oh, lordy, we're off the... The window's too big, isn't it? Let's drag it back and shrink it a little. <coughs> and put it back again. Now, to try and illustrate what actually happened just then, at least what might have happened. The first thing that, the first thing that we actually did, or at least we would have done, except this information was almost certainly cached,
was ask one of the root servers. Now you'll notice that, um, and what my, you notice I can't type and talk at the same time, or chew gum and whatever. Here we go. We'd ask one of the name servers, well, one of the root name servers, and the root name server has come back and said, I don't have an answer for you, but I can tell you that you, your next step should probably be the UK authority. And by the way, here is the, here's, a list of, um, here's a list of name servers for the UK authority. Okay, and being helpful, here's our addresses. So we'll then repeat, and I'll put, sakes, come on. Um, that was good. I'm not quite sure what I did there, but anyway. Um, let's make it even smaller. There we go. That's better. So we'll, the next thing we'll do is repeat that query, but this time we'll send exactly the same query to the, the UK, one of the UK name servers. This again won't have an answer for us, but it'll tell us, right, you need to go and look here at the name server of Mythic Beasts. And you'll notice that we don't get additional data with the, with the address of those name servers because those name servers are in .com. They're not in .uk. So we'll finally repeat the query and send that to pick one of those ones, ns1.com. And hurrah, we get an answer and if I was able to scroll up, or which I'm not, um, if I would scroll up very slightly, you'd see that one of the flags that came back on that answer was the AA flag, because we just asked the authoritative server, and we got an authoritative answer. Pipe it yeah, I will do next time. All right, let's pipe it through less now, just to prove. Right. There we go. <coughs> AA. Excellent. Everything's worked as I expected it. Which is good. I was trying this out in my Airbnb last night, which had a BT Home Hub router and was on the BT network, and I couldn't get anything to work the way I expected it to. <laughs> Luckily, the... Um, <clears throat> about More about that later. Um, luckily, the hotel... Uh, a hotel Wi-Fi is a little bit more... Cooperative. So, moving on. So, that's a quick overview of how the traditional DNS system works. Now, most of you, I expect, will at some point have written some code using something like this. Because um, this is the traditional way that you do name lookups on, oh, God, on places has moved. There we go. This is the traditional way that one has done name lookups from C programs. Uh, the dreaded get host by name. Okay. And I'm picking the results from various appalling structures afterwards. And then doing the reverse thing using get host by adra. Now, I do hope you know that you're not supposed to be doing that these days. Um, you are supposed instead to be using get adra info, which is even more complicated. Okay, uh, the reason for get adra info and its counterpart um, get name info, the reason you're supposed to be using those is that they can cope with IP6. Get host by name and get host by adra can't. Okay, um, so here I go trying to do a lookup with get adra info. For the H, get adder info also um, handles service names for you uh, as well. I'm just doing a lookup for an address here and then picking through the results afterwards and converting things into SOC adder ins and whatever. It's, it's tedious, isn't it? It's not something that really works well, that I feel works terribly easily. And, C or indeed C++. Here's, here's get name info. 
um, which assumes you're starting with the SOC ADRA um, and is mer looks mercifully a bit simpler. But on the other hand, that's not usually the way you're trying to go. Okay. Um, I'm sure you all know that, and, I, and I'm sure you've all written the bits of code that use that. One important thing about both those calls is they're both synchronous. You call one of those, and you ain't getting control back until the packet has flown out and stuff has come back, whatever, which may or may not be what you want. Now, following 1987, there's, there's a reasonable stream of RFCs coming along. Uh, a lot of which are concerned with basically server management issues. Um, and it's not until 1999, actually, that the next interesting thing from our point of view happens. And that interesting thing is the extension mechanism for DNS, eDNS0, as it was called. The motivation for this, as the abstract says, is that the wire protocol has, as we've seen, some fixed fields. And they were starting to feel a bit of, a, a bit of pressure on one of them, on some of them. Um, if you're reading this today, incidentally, head straight for RFC 6891 from 2013, which is the, yeah, it kind of, this, is, this is how it really works now, and it lists the ideas that seemed a good idea at the, in 1999, but never really took off. Uh, there was an attempt to do an alternate uh, name compression scheme that just never, ever got off the ground in reality. Now, eDNS0 is best regarded as a bit of a hack um, because the DNS is baked into everything. You're, you, whether you like it or not, you have to deal with devices that only understood, only understood what was current not merely when they were made, not merely when their firmware was written, but the last time that the programmer who wrote their firmware actually bothered to read anything. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> your lag time on this stuff is massive. The main things that are of interest to us right now, there is a, there's something else which I'll be coming to, is it did two things. It extended the range of return codes that are available or rather the space for the range of return codes, and it extended the number of flags that you could have. But the other thing, which was almost, the, which was a just as big a driver, is there's a mechanism to allow larger UDP messages. Okay? This was driven because the size of DNS uh, uh, resource records had been slowly increasing. Quad A records, are obviously bigger than A records. People were finding all kinds of interesting things to do with text records. Okay. And finally, it lays a certain amount of necessary groundwork for DNSSEC, which I'm coming on to later. Um, so I'll cover that at the time. And the way they did this was create a, a new resource record type called OPT. It's unlike every other resource record type. It doesn't exist in your zone information. Instead, this is something that's generated on the fly by your client and, and by the server in response. So the point about this is that an existing piece of DNS software will look at it and just go, oh, that's a resource record. I don't understand. I'll ignore it. Um, you, you can sneak this information in there. It's a, that's, that's actually a good point. I'll have to check that one, but you might be right on there. Yeah. And anyway, so what it does is it takes the classic RR structure um, and just repurposes <laughs> some of the fields. So that the class record, 16 bits, it now becomes the sender UDP payload size. This is the size of a UDP payload that the sender of this message reckons it will be able to accept. So if a receiver sees one of those, it knows it can send a larger packet than it might otherwise have been able to. And you can stick with UDP without having to fall back to TCP. And this is a good thing. Shouldn't that rely on portable MP source discovery working properly? 
it's a guess. <laughs> it's a, I think I can do that. As far as I know, it's a, I think I can do this. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, if, you, if you try it and you just get back a truncated, a, 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 a message with a truncation flag set, well, sorry, you're going to have to fall back anyway. Um, the, TT, uh, uh, the TTL, uh, 32 bits worth, was split into eight bits of extended result, uh, result code, an eight-bit version for which there is one defined value, zero, still, and 16 bits reserved for flags, and currently there is one flag defined for those. So we've got a bit of room to grow. And in the R data, there's this concept of options, an option code, an option length, and then that length of option data, okay? At this moment in time, there are zero defined options in the standards. But actually, this is important for reasons, again, I'll be coming on to. The next thing that happened in the DNS world was that it turned out security wasn't very good. Okay? You can poison the cache in recursive servers. And this is actually quite fun. This... <laughs> so, how does the client match a response to a query that it sent? Well, the response arrives on the same UDP port. The questions match something it's asked. The query ID matches something it's asked. In fact, what you do first is look for a query ID and then check the question. Um, and this is an interesting one. Authority and additional sections contain names in the same domain. It's called Balowick checking. I'm not sure how often it happens, but it should do. So, how hard is it to fake a response? Well, it turned out. And what happens if you do fake a response? Well, the crucial thing here is the first good answer wins. The first, because there's no other mechanism to distinguish them. The first answer that hits a server is the answer that it will take. So, here's how you do basic cache poisoning. Okay. Send a query for my.bank.com to your victim name server. You know that it's going to be, unless it has the value in its cache, it's going to be asking the bank name server for that address. So a recursive query is going to go off to the bank name server. If you flood your victim name server with forged replies, giving the answer to your query, but with your preferred answer data, <laughs> OK? You don't know the query ID on the query that went there. But in fact, for a long time, it was quite predictable. Um, tip, there was actually, you know, typically what would happen is that the recursive server would get your query, it would add one to the query ID and send it off. The first guy who wrote a paper on this didn't publish it for two years because he was so appalled by what he found. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Um, now, uh, the answer for this turned out to be randomizing the query ID. So basically find, uh, rather than doing simple stuff with the query ID, pick a truly random number and make sure it's a truly random one as well. Then in 2008, Dan Kaminsky took this to another level, okay, and did something much more fun, which is don't bother just trying to subvert the A record that you get back. No, no, send it Duff Authority. Try and persuade it to use your name server for the entire domain. Brilliant. Now, the way this works is you generate a random name in your target domain, Send that to your victim name server. Send a truckload of forged answers to that name server. But instead of giving A records, you give it an NS record with your name server, the server that you've got ready to take over in there. And you can even use the real name server names, but give it Duff additional data. In fact, these days, uh, DNS sof software is supposed to regard additional addresses with a certain amount of suspicion. 
Okay. And then, if you get lucky and you match the query ID, you own the zone. And typically in here, you'll set a huge TTL. So if you do own it, you'll own it for a long time. <laughs> okay. Now, this is quite interesting, because when this came out, you know, the community looked at it and went, oh, lordy. Um, oh, come on, it's going to take forever. Because you're going to have to hit, you're going to have to match that random 16-bit quantity. Okay. Um, and a little while after that, uh, one of the, I, I work for a husband, Synodon is me and a husband and wife, John and Sarah Dickinson. And um, a little while after this came out, John was at a conference where this was being described. Um, and the speaker said, yeah, but it's going to take a very long time before you'll be able to break in. Uh, and John stood up and said, well, I wrote a program to try it. And it took eight seconds. <laughs> Because you, because you can generate so many random names, you can go absolutely to town on this one. Now, the answer to this, and the problem here is you've just got insufficient random space. Okay, ideally you'd want to do something like increase the query size to 32 bits, but you can't do that. Not without reprogramming every device on the planet, which is not gonna happen. Uh, so the way this is, uh, counted now is query source port randomization to add another 16 bits of entropy, well, nearly 16 bits of entropy into, into the mix. Those of you who've been following System D will know that System D have recently added their own DNS resolver. They didn't talk to anyone in the DNS community first, and I was recently reading. Uh, basically a long article from a guy called Paul Valters in Canada um, of the things that they'd messed up. And actually not doing source port randomization was something they'd messed up. They do it now, but anyway. So yes, you do that a lot for a lot of different host names. Now, as it happens, the answer to this was already present, DNSSEC. Well, what will probably happen, well, I suppose, you, I, I, that's a good question, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I see what you mean. In fact, your name server will just collapse horribly um, because that many TCP se sessions connecting at once. Typically on a TCP session, you only send one query uh, at a go. Um, at, uh, and the DNS world generally just wants to stick with UDP because it's easy. easy. Um, any rate. Um, in fact, okay, DNSSEC, secure DNS. This was around already. Uh, the first DNSSEC RFCs appeared in 1995, I think. The only problem was that, well, you know what happens when you do anything that's new and secure? It takes you about three goes to get it right. <laughs> and DNSSEC as it exists now, the RFCs are from 2005 and you can see a, a, a quite fantastic list of RFCs that got updated or obsoleted completely <laughs> by this. Um, so let's have a look at what it is. DNSSEC assures authenticity of DNS data. It ensures, assures you of the integrity of that data. It authenticates the data, not the servers. So it's not like TLS. It's telling you that the data is, it matches what it should be. It does not ensure confidentiality. And that's an important thing. People think the, the SEC stands for secure. It's secure in the sense of, yes, this really is the data that it should be. It's not secure in the sense that nobody else can see it. Okay? And essentially the way it works is that a domain will have a key. Now typically, actually, a domain will have a key signing key and a zone signing key. Okay? The key signing key signs the zone signing key and is then kept offline. The zone signing key is what you use for signing the zone, signing all the data in the zone. I'm going to come. I'm going to try and get through how this actually happens. Okay. Um, the so the the root 
key signing key, you know, is kept under a mountain in a locked bunker in two locations on opposite sides of the US or whatever. The zone signing key is rotated about four time, uh, three or four times a year. Next year, there is a rotate, they're changing the key signing key, which should be quite interesting. There's been lots of arguments about whether you should do this or not, typically revolving around what about people who buy kit, leave it standing on a shelf for six years and then plug it in for the first time. The thinking on this is that, well, look, we are going to have to re we're going to have to change the key signing key at some point. The last thing we want to do is for that to be an emergency and the first time we've ever done it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now this is that the domain that I the, the domain that I set up and the reason I use Mythic Beasts is Mythic Beasts have a lovely button on their DNS management page that says enable DNSSEC for this. It sets up everything for you. And now, of course, if you're going to be doing this properly, you'll want to generate the key, your, the key signing key yourself and keep it offline and all that sort of thing. But for the purposes of the, this afternoon, um, that saved me a hell of a lot of work. Um, UK zone is signed. Uh, the, all, uh, the UK zone and, and all the nominate stuff underneath it. Um, and we come down to my own now, key signing key. Mythic has generated two zone signing keys for some reason. All my records are signed. Hurrah! Um, it achieves this by four new resource record types. Uh, a key, the public key signature. Uh, there's a flag in there to say whether it's a key signing key or a zone signing key. RRC, this is the signature of resource record sets. Remember, you can have, in response to a query on a name, you can have multiple A records, multiple quad A records, whatever. An RR set is just the set of that data. So there's one signature for all your quad A records, for example. Another important thing, which I'm not really going to talk about, um, because A, it's a bit hairy, and B, I don't really quite understand it, is... Uh, NSEC records, which are used for a couple of purposes, but the main one is verifying that, authenticating that a host definitely doesn't exist. Uh, NSEC 3 is the second attempt because you can use NSEC to enumerate all the hosts in a, domain, in a domain that do exist, and some people didn't like that idea. And finally, and the important thing, the DS record is a digest of the DNS key, but it sits at the top end of the delegation. So here, that DS record is a digest of this key. Okay, but sits up above. So when you are, for example, when you are trying to verify um, the content, that the key of .uk is what .uk say it is, and that you haven't been intercepted, you get that information off the root servers and all the way down. Now, in fact, so there is a single um, trusted, you can have just the single trusted root, which is the ICANN key. Okay? In fact, actually, you can put trust points in anywhere. Um, you may choose not to trust ICANN, and I certainly wouldn't trust Nominet further than I could throw them. So you may prefer to put a trust key at the level of your organization um, and just verify stuff within your organization on that trust key. That is possible. Um, now, a couple of things on the wire are new, there's an eDNS flag D0, which just means, hey, I'm the client, I understand DNSSEC. I would like to, and you may send me those records and I'll know what to do with them. And there are two new flags, which were on the original, um, the original diagram that I showed you. The AD flag, if that comes back from the server, that's saying, I've authenticated this data. The other one is uh, one for the send, uh, sender to send it. It's a checking disabled. It just say, look, I'm going to check. Just send me the data. Don't bother checking it yourself. 
or at least you can check it yourself if you want to, but don't delay. Send me it straight away because I'm going to check it. Now, if you, unless you have that flag set, if the server gets data and it fails authentication, then you'll just get a server fail error. You won't get data back. So from your point of view, it just looks like the record doesn't exist, which is pretty much actually, I think, what you want. Okay? That leads us to the last mile problem. Because, of course, most of us these days are just getting our answers off your ISP server. Now, maybe your ISP does authentication. Maybe it doesn't, but you're still vulnerable over that last mile. So the questions you need to start worrying about is, can your stub resolver do validation? Uh, does your resolving server do validation? And if it can, do you trust the link between it and you? This is one reason for putting full-blown uh, resolving servers as on your host, as your local resolver. Because you can probably, well, as far as you can trust anything, you can probably trust what's something that's running on your server and is doing the validation. Uh, but I'll come back to that. There's a couple of interesting things. This one, this thing is just really cool because I installed it. It's a Debian, it, it's packaged for Debian. I installed it a couple of nights ago. Um, it's from NL Net Labs, and who, they provide uh, Unbound, and which is one of the major DNS servers uh, these days. And basically, it installs a local copy of Unbound on your system, configures it to do DNSSEC authentication. Um, with a whole bunch of fallbacks as well. It'll see if your local, it'll see if your upstream resolver does it. If it doesn't, it'll go further, it'll try and validate it itself. And in total desperate extremists, it will use a dedicated server run by NL Netlabs that it knows works properly. Okay. Um, and I'm also, I will also mention GetDNS Stubby, which is a stub resolver which does validation. Now, at this point, I was going to drop back and show you again what DNSSEC looks like when we're doing it from the packets. Um, I was terribly worried that I wasn't going to have enough material. <laughs> so I'm going to skip over that for now um, and carry on. Um, and we might go back to it. Because the next thing I want to talk about is, OK, if you then have a DNS system where you can trust the data you're getting back, you can put stuff in there. And how about this? There's a bunch of RFCs on the subject, actually, doing things like putting SSH host keys in DKIM keys, um, TLS certificates into the DNS. And essentially, there's a vision that what you could do is use this instead of the existing global X509 certificate authority network, which I think is really actually quite nice because I would love to be able to, in the information on my domain, say either if you're doing a TLS, if you're doing an HTTPS connection to my server, this is the certificate you should find. Okay, I mean, Let's Encrypt has changed the game a bit on this, so it's no longer that difficult to get hold of a certificate, but how much can you really trust what you get from Let's Encrypt? It's relatively, relatively easy to get certificates. And we've all seen quite a lot of unfortunate incidents with unfortunate certificate authorities who, were managed, who nevertheless were in the, the list of magic certificate authorities trusted by your browser. It's quite interesting. The snag on all this at the moment is currently virtually all the domain providers, the root key is signed. Now, the root key, as of October last year, the zone signing key is now 2048-bit RSA. The minute you hit .uk, and this is the same for nearly everybody else, the key signing key is 204 bit, but the zone signing key is only 1024 bit. Ouch. So the browser people are currently going, no, nope. 
1024 bit is not good enough. The DNS operators will nominate, I did actually ask nominate, and they're basically sitting there saying, um, no, we haven't really thought about it. <laughs> what they mean is, no, nah, that might cost money. We can't be asked. Um, to be fair to them, it does seriously increase the size of the signatures you're carrying around and the, the domain data that you have. It's possible that um, one thing that's coming on stream at the moment is the use of elliptic curve for signing. Um, it's already, there's provisions for it in the RFC and you can already do it, but it's spreading out slowly. Maybe they're just waiting for that to become a commonplace because that'll be a much shorter key length. Maybe. I don't know. Now at this point, for those of you who didn't know, this one is implemented and it's in SSH. Okay. Um, actually, should we, give, should we give it a quick go? Yeah. Now, this is a bit of a cheat because actually this just uses the regular DNS. The point about this is um, now, if I do SSH ACCU conference.org.uk, you all know what's going to happen. That. The authenticity, oh, this can't be established. Here's its fingerprint, do you trust it? Hands up all those who've ever said no. <laughs> or indeed, ever checked. Yeah. You said no once. Did you, really? When it changes. Well, when it changes, you go, oh dear, why has it changed? Oh, I suppose I know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Right. Add this option. Add this option. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm pointing a laser at my palm at the moment. Right. <laughs> Look at that. Matching host key fingerprints found in DNS. If I'd set that option to yes it would have just gone, whoop, yep, I trust it, and add it to your known host file. Because in my DNS, I have that, an SSHFP record, and that is the host key for my server. You generate it by SSH keygen minus R hostname. Okay. After quite a lot of faffing around, you then discover it is necessary to run that command on the actual host <laughs> because it always gives you the key for the host that it happens to be running on, which is not entirely what I'd expected and certainly not what the documentation implies. But <clears throat> there we go. Now here, of course, the problem, the problem with what I've just done is that was not using DNSSEC because the local resolver is not DNSSEC aware. Okay? If I set up my system to use DNSSEC, then I would be safe doing this because if this could not be authenticated, I wouldn't see it. Okay. But I think this is really quite cool myself. I'm not sure that it does. It, I, if, if, if I remember rightly, there is code in OpenSSH possibly to do this, but it's not necessary. It's not compiled because there is a there is an option. Um, I did find an SSH uh, option of uh, yeah DNSSEC something or other. Okay, um, and it's not compiled into the Debian build. Okay, so hey ho. Um, uh, there we go. So that, that was the terminal window. Now, okay, so you probably gathered that using DNSSEC locally can be a problem. How could you use it from your application? Now, the first thing is don't try and write your own resolver unless you really have a lot of time to spare. Um, <laughs> and you're going to get it right. Okay, there's, it, it's one of those things, one of the other 
one of the other sayings they have in the DNS community is that DNS takes an hour to learn and a lifetime to get right. <laughs> but, uh, and one of the problems with DNSSEC is that it may never go into the standard into the standard libraries, not in the way that get adder info is these days. There's a, there's a, they started talking about doing it, I think, about a year ago. Should we put this in glibc? Okay. Um, there's actually a certain amount of pushback on that because there are, because you will be making, you will be dragging down more information. You will be making, quite probably a few times, some additional lookups. Do you want to be always paying that price? One of the problems with DNSSEC at the moment is it's stuck in the, it could be incredibly useful, but everyone has to get with the program, but no one wants to get with the program until everybody's using it. Uh, situations. Okay, so time for a library, and this is, there's a few around that do it. I'm going to stick in an advert for a library called GetDNS. Um, this is its main web page. My reason for doing this is that uh, this is a library that's actually being done by the DNS community at the moment, but aimed at application people. Okay. Um, and yes, we're working on this, okay, along with NLNet Labs and VeriSign, uh, amongst others. So it can operate in stable, full recursive mode. It supports all current RR types. Um, you get fine-grained access to the response, and it will do DNSSEC validation. You can ask it to do DNSSEC validation even when it's just in stub mode and other goodies. Um, it's in C, it's got bindings for Python, Node.js. Um, if you're really interested, I hacked up a binding for Go, but which is not generally out there at the moment. Its only dependency is OpenSSL. It's asynchronous by default, okay, with support for various event loops in there. And the crucial thing about this library is that it gives you back it gives you access to the full data that came back, should you be interested in any of it, in essentially a JSON dick-like form. Um, and in fact, most of the hassle of using this library from C, there is no C++ binding at the moment, and if anybody's feeling particularly enthusiastic and is C++ is better than mine, might be interested in having a go. Um, this is the core API. There's lots of other calls, most of which are devoted to the very tedious business of dealing with lists and dictionaries from C. That's it. And in fact, these, all of these, boil down to this with a few special cases. That's just doing a general lockup of any kind of DNS record and showing you the data that comes back. Um, and the data that comes back looks like this. Okay, um, I don't expect you to read through that in great detail. It's of no interest to you whatsoever until you need to know it. And at that point, it gets fantastically interesting. Um, it does break down uh, the resource records data for you. So, for example, if you're looking up an MX record, it knows about MX records, and so it will split out server names and priorities for you uh, in there. Um, but it will also, in each case, give you access to the raw data as well, should you be up to something else. Okay. Um, the, I can thoroughly recommend the Python bindings because dealing with this in Python is a total piece of cake. Um, this is the sort of thing that fits very well in Python and is a bit of a mare for any statically typed language to deal with. But there we go. Um, and this is a quick bit of sample code on how you use it. Um, it's not really terribly complicated. You need a context for, uh, which has the basic information for accessing your server. In you just ask it to create a context and one happens. Um, and then this is setting a dictionary with various parameters before we do the call. Uh, sorry, where, where's it gone? Uh, here we go. Get DNS general sync. 
This is a synchronous version of the call because I didn't want to show you all setting up all the callback and stuff. The examples have got the full callback um, information in there. So this is, this is just trying to get an A record for something. It's doing, it's actually doing a sort of uh, DNS, uh, DNS address lookup, but it's doing it the hard way, if I can put it that way. Um, and then picking the data out of the answer all by itself. So the point here is that um, using a library like that, because the, the big problem with the existing get adder info interface is that you can only look up A records in it. You can't interact with the DNS generally. And this, in a way, brings us on to the final topic I have, DNS privacy. Now, you'll be aware that one of the things that this wonderful gentleman told us is the extent to which um, the world spooks actually listen in on DNS traffic. And this did not go down well in the IETF community. Okay. In fact, uh, coincidentally, a month after the Snowden revelations came out, this RFC, uh, this RFC was published, Privacy Considerations of Internet Protocols. After they'd had a while to think about it, they produced RFC 7258, nailed their colours firmly to the mask. Pervasive monitoring is an attack. <laughs> okay. The IETF's technical assessment is that pervasive monitoring is an attack on the privacy of internet users and organisations. The IETF community has expressed strong agreement that pervasive monitoring is an attack that needs to be mitigated where possible via the design of protocols that make pervasive monitoring significantly more expensive or infeasible. Well, that's right. Now tell us what you really think. <laughs> uh, and there's, there's a few other interesting RFCs um, as well about confidentiality in the face of pervasive surveillance and uh, another one, and uh, some assessments of potential attacks on the DNS system. Now, so this. When DNSSEC first came out, people kind of went, well, okay, so it doesn't hide your lookups, but that's not really important, is it? Because let's say we hide your lookups for um, bankwearethinkingoftakingover.com or whatever. Yes, maybe, this, maybe spies cannot see your lookup for bankwearethinkingover.com. What they will see immediately afterwards is a whole bunch of server connections to bankwearethinkingoftakingover.com coming from your... Uh, so, it, you know, it's not really going to tell them much. But let's have a think about this. Well, first of all, um, as you've seen, the full domain name gets sent everywhere from the root downwards. Okay, so that's potentially at least, well, certain, it's potentially the root server seeing your query and then every layer of, of authoritative servers underneath that also seeing your query, which is a reasonable amount of leakage. Um, and yes, although knowing you're looking up a particular host name may not be so bad, remember I've just been talking about other things you can stick in the DNS. Some of the things we're talking about are open PGP certificates. Maybe, uh, so, it's possible, in other words, that things related to a user will be going in the DNS. Service discovery records often have quite a lot of information in that. Service discovery records are the mechanisms by which, for example, um, your iPhone may notice that somebody else near you is sharing their music collection. <laughs> and how many people do you know whose phones have a host name called Alice's Mobile? You're in, a shop, you're in a cafe. There are two people using an Apple device in your cafe. Okay, one of them is broadcasting a server name. One of these people is male, the other one's female. The, the, the name is Alice's phone. You've probably just identified which one of those people is operating that device. I also mentioned eDNS included uh, an options mechanism uh, for which there are zero defined option codes at the moment. However, people are using them. 
Okay. Parental filters. ISP parental filters. Some of those stick user information into an eDNS option so that when it arrives at the ISP, uh, uh, the ISP recursive server, the recursive server can go, who is this person? Should I be responding to this domain name? Okay? And remember, that's going to everything all the way down, possibly for, you know, it may not just be going to your ISP server. CDRs, um, content delivery, sorry, CDNs, content delivery networks, um, they sometimes stick geographical information in there. I mean, they've got a perfectly valid reason to, because you probably want to be using the YouTube server that's closest to you, mm, but yeah, yeah, mm, mm. And some, some bits of client equipment, go and add your MAC address or your local subnet in there as well. <clears throat> this is not good. And generally, this leaking of metadata allows you to re-identify individuals. Once you've got an identification on an individual, this leakage of metadata may allow you to... Uh, uh, Right, uh, does it? Okay. So, so, the, yeah. the CDN, so the CDN yeah. can see the real one. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there's, there's, a nice, there's a nice RFC from, by Stefan Bortsmeyer from a couple of years ago about the privacy implications of what goes into DNS. Now, there's a lot of standards activity on this at the moment, actually. The whole DNS standards world basically suddenly woke up a few years ago and they published about 12 RFCs in the last couple of years, and there's a load more coming down the pipeline on this. There are various solutions being proposed to this, doing DNS with start, over TCP with start TLS, uh, DNS over DTLS, that's datagram TLS, or DNS over TLS to a new port. Um, that's the only one that's made it as far as RFC status for um, local to recursive server link. It's port 853. And it's supported in GetDNS. You can use that now. So, in brief, DNSSEC is arriving, but slowly, and there are lots of, and there are still problems. Okay, um, I would say it's the sort of thing that you might consider using for particular specialized applications at the moment, where you control the environment. I, I hope, as time goes by, it'll become ubiquitous, but unfortunately there's quite a lot of organizations need to get with the program first. And in the memorable words of, um, was it dear, dear, dear Mr. Bourne of Bourne Shell fame once likened using TSO as kicking a dead whale down a beach? <laughs> there's a bit of whale kicking to be done, I think. There are issues remaining with key length, and what I will generally call the Internet of Things, or as it's known in ITF circles, the Internet of Shit. <laughs> <laughs> but there is lots of activity happening in the DNS privacy space at the moment. Um, DNS is not dead, and you can use DNS over, over TLS today if you want to and you're prepared to put a bit of work into it. The same applies for um, uh, DNSSEC. The Google resolvers are DNSSEC aware and they do DNSSEC authenticate. That was going to be something I would show you. If you go, if you dig on accuconference.org.uk and say um, to the, one of the Google servers, you'll get back a result with an AD flag in it. So it's doing it. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a certain distance to go. Um, this, I found this, uh, my, you know, as I said, my boss, Sarah, she, um, she's one of the gods of DNS privacy. And she did a presentation to um, some steering, ITF steering committees on this recently. 
Um, and that quote was at the end. Um, and actually, that's a brilliant metaphor for programming generally. <laughs> anyway, so, um, sorry I didn't get, uh, sorry I didn't manage to show you DNSSEC in all its gory detail with DIG, but um, there's lots of stuff out there explaining how it works. And, and actually, once you stare at it for a while, um, it's re it, it's not difficult. There's, there's not magic going on. Essentially what happens is for every record in your DNS, or for every record set, I should say, there's an RR SIG record which has got the signature of that data. It's reasonably obvious to see how data is authenticated. Okay. If you want to know more, come and ask me, and I will probably point you in the direction of somebody who knows. Okay, so thank you very much for coming. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so how, sec how secure is DNS today generally? How many attacks are happening? I don't, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. Um, I mean, the thing is, any attack like that, I would be willing to bet that any attack like that, say, on a Google server, is not going to succeed because they will see the volume. Mm -hmm. They will have tooling uh, again, uh, against that. As long as you're doing source port um, randomization, that makes it significantly more difficult. I mean, remember the attack that John demonstrated, uh, he could succeed on in eight seconds. That was without source port minimization. Source port minimization adds quite a lot of entropy in. So hopefully, but it is, but you do see, there are attacks. People do try this. So you're saying I shouldn't be worried? You shouldn't be too worried at the moment, but maybe asking your ISP why they don't support DNSSEC <laughs> would be a good plan for the future. Would anybody like a chocolate? <laughs> yeah, I had one already. Oh, come, and, come and grab a chocolate if you want. Otherwise, it's half past five, and I think I'm supposed to shut up. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>